what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Over three years ago, Americans witnessed domestic and global markets deteriorating, resulting in millions of job losses and unprecedented measures by governments and central banks to prop up financial institutions. As the United States economy remains vulnerable in the midst of a recovery, just across the Atlantic, our friends in the European Union fight to fend off a second wave of economic and financial turmoil. Today's hearing examines the economic unrest facing Europe, actions undertaken by central banks and international organizations in response, options that remain at our disposal, and potential consequences to the U.S. economy and taxpayers. During the onset of the 2008-2009 financial crisis, asset-backed securities, chiefly mortgage-backed securities, unexpectedly became illiquid and fell sharply in value, resulting in a housing bust. Now, housing downturn ended up with an asset crunch that ended up in a larger housing bust. Financial firms were forced to write down losses that depleted their capital base and reduced their access to private liquidity. In response, the U.S. Treasury, Federal Reserve, and the United States Congress acted, well, in a way that uh, the American people are very familiar with. They know this story. Today, Europe's version of this story appears to be one of which sovereign debt plays the role of asset-backed securities. Some say history repeats itself. Others say that it simply rhymes. Uh, this may be the case of history repeating itself or simply feeling and it seeming like uh, uh, the last crisis, or perhaps uh, the uh, European uh, uh, successor to what happened between World War I and World War II. Um, Europe's banks hold substantial amounts of European sovereign debt that has dropped in value as the debt of periphery countries has become unmanageable. Given the substantial amounts of sovereign debt on the books of European banks, their ability to borrow has been brought into question. Perhaps these European sovereigns are uh, analogous to uh, Freddie, and, uh, Freddie and Fannie preferred that uh, many thrifts and uh, small banks across this country held as Tier 1 capital. The European twist to the story is that nations, have, uh, nations home to the most troubled banks do not have the financial capacity, uh, perhaps, to bail them out. Austerity measures and maxed out balance sheets of periphery countries, known as PIGs, have left the EU and its central bank scrambling to identify uh, an intervention to end the panic and restore normalcy to the markets. As time runs out for the EU, work, uh, uh, works to strengthen its framework and the European Central Bank retain, um, retains its dubious role as leader of last resort, or lender of last resort, I should say. <coughs> a reoccurring financial savior inserting itself in the mix. The Federal Reserve and, to a lesser extent, the IMF are also providing this same notion. Last month, in an effort to aid European banks that have, uh, that have trouble accessing dollars due to market skepticism about their uh, health, six central banks, led by the Federal Reserve, made it cheaper for banks to borrow dollars to ease Europe's sovereign debt crisis. In the program's first month, there have been over $50 billion in transactions, prompting two immediate questions. Does the Fed's action, uh, is it permitted, uh, <clears throat> rather, does the Fed action permit banks to get through the crisis without addressing their most toxic assets? And has the Fed averted a liquidity crisis or simply postponed an insolvency crisis? Just yesterday, IMF Director Christine Lagarde said, there is no economy in the world, whether low-income countries, emerging markets, middle-income countries, or super-advanced economies, that will be immune to the crisis that we see uh, not only unfolding but escalating. Director Lagarde's remarks are troubling and remind us of the significance a financial meltdown has on the global economy. If events in Europe threaten U.S. banks and its economy, American policymakers must know the facts of the situation and be ready to act. Despite differences of opinion about 
the Fed and U.S. Treasury actions, the, rea the reality is only a handful of individuals at each institution and department truly understand U.S. exposure to, to the Eurozone crisis. Today's oversight hearing allows the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, and the United States Treasury, all of which operate as our nation's foremost decision makers in the areas of uh, economics and monetary policy, to, communi to communicate to Congress and to the American public about what is happening. As daily headlines read of uh, capital injections to the tune of billions and trillions of euros and dollars, reinforcing the interconnectedness of the global economy, it is vital that Congress conduct oversight on rescue proposals and threats to our economy. Simple question must be answered, very simple questions such as, uh, are the actions of the Federal Reserve consistent with its mandate, and are the firms seeking liquidity simply illiquid or perhaps insolvent? I am interested to hear from this panel and from each of you about your views on this uh, Eurozone crisis current potential rescue efforts, and the consequences of the crisis uh, on the United States, not just to the United States, but to our government, not just to our government, to our economy, not just to our economy, our citizens and taxpayers. That is what this hearing is about. We don't want to be caught flat-footed on what is happening in the global economy, and that is why policymakers on the Hill must know uh, what the potential actions you can take, uh, how you view this crisis, and the actions um, uh, that you have taken. Uh, with that, I recognize the ranking member, uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday we heard from several nongovernmental witnesses with a shared concern of the Euro debt crisis. There was a general agreement that a debt default in Europe would have a devastating consequence for U.S. taxpayers. As Mr. Elliott testified, we are exposed to nearly $5 trillion in potential losses on loans and commitments to European governments, banks, and corporations. At the same time, yesterday's witnesses differed on the point of whether Europe can resolve this crisis with its own resources. Today, I look forward to hearing from our government witnesses who can speak to their roles in resolving this crisis. We should, we should be pushing Europe to act quickly and responsibly, but we cannot expose the U.S. taxpayer to potential losses. <clears throat> uh, thank you, and I would like to yield the balance of my time to the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling the hearings yesterday and today on the financial crisis in Europe and its potential effects on the United States. At yesterday's hearing, we heard that Europe faces two problems. One is a long-term budgetary problem that will require scaling back expenditures. The other is a much more imminent threat that a major European country might default on its debt. It appears that European officials are paying close attention to the long-term problem at the expense of aggravating the acute crisis. Yesterday, Desmond Latchman, an economist with, and policy expert with the American Enterprise Institute, testified as follows. There is a very real risk that continuing to apply substantial fiscal tightening will lead to a very deep economic recession. A deep recession would make it very difficult for countries to reduce their budget deficits and would undermine their political willingness to remain within the euro. In 2008, when our own country faced a financial crisis, the Federal Reserve took action to prevent an immediate financial panic by acting as a lender of last resort. It did not insist that Congress first agree on how to slash the Federal deficit, cut the Federal workforce, cut Medicare, and cut Social Security. Although the actions taken in 2008 were not without controversy, the immediate financial crisis had to be averted. Long-term measures were left for the long term. Unfortunately, perhaps dangerously, the European Central Bank is balking at functioning as lender of last resort. My concern is that this failure to act now could result in a deep recession in Europe or an insolvency of a major European bank, which could put our own economic recovery at risk. Of course, our own recovery is not complete by any measure. It is true that after unprecedented assistance unprecedented assistance from the American taxpayers, corporate profits have returned to their highest level in years. Executives are making record salaries, and the richest Americans are continuing to see their incomes and records grow exponentially. Main Street, however, is struggling, struggling mightily. The unemployment rate continues to hover at 9 percent. Mortgage servicers 
continues to foreclose on millions of American families, many of them in my district, and banks have yet to be accountable for the abuses that cause this crisis. For these reasons, I am glad that William Dudley, the President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, is testifying today. Just last month, he gave a speech at West Point in which he called on Congress and the Administration to continue, to continue near-term fiscal support to underpin economic activity and long-term fiscal, fiscal consolidation to ensure debt, debt su sustainability. He also explained that addressing the housing crisis is essential to restoring the strength of our economy. Specifically, he called for borrowers who are underwater on their loans but continue to make their monthly payments to earn accelerated principal reduction over time. He also called for more effective refinancing programs to eliminate frictions and lower costs to refinancing for all borrowers with prime conforming loans. His message is directed to us in this Congress and we should pay close attention to it. Examining European financial crisis is a very important endeavor. It is a real threat to European countries and to the United States, and I commend the Chairman for holding these hearings. It is my hope, however, that our committee will also focus on efforts to help Main Street USA and the millions of middle class American families and workers who were the true victims of the financial crisis we face here at home. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Members have seven days to submit opening statements for the record and will now recognize our panel of witnesses. Mr. William C. Dudley is the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Mr. Stephen B. Kamen is the Director of the Division of International Finance at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Mr. Mark Sobel is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Monetary and Financial Policy at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Um, it is the policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn before they testify. So if you will please uh, rise and raise your right, arm, right hand <coughs> and arm as well. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You may be seated. Uh, let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. And with that, uh, no, uh, as you uh, well know from congressional hearings, uh, we have a light system. Uh, green means go, uh, red means stop, yellow means, well, just like a stoplight, hurry up. So um, uh, with that, you will have five minutes to summarize your opening statements, and we will begin with you, Mr. Dudley. Thank you. Uh, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, uh, Congressman Cummings, and members of the subcommittee, it is an honor to testify before you today to discuss the economic and fiscal challenges facing Europe and the potential implications for the United States. Let me preface these remarks by stating that the views expressed in my written and oral testimony are solely my own and do not represent the official views of the Federal Reserve Board or any other part of the Federal Reserve System. Although the U.S. economy is currently expanding at a moderate pace, we face significant downside risks, mostly relating to the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, because developments in Europe will have an important bearing on the prospects for growth and jobs here in the United States. The Federal Reserve is monitoring the situation there very closely. This is also why we have taken special steps in cooperation with other central banks to support the flow of credit to households and businesses. I welcome the opportunity to testify on these matters today. The situation in the euro area is very unsettled with pressure on sovereign debt markets and local banking systems. The euro area has the capacity, including the fiscal capacity, to overcome its challenges. However, the politics are very difficult. Europe's leadership has affirmed its commitment to the European Union and its single currency monetary union on numerous occasions. And the leadership is working to achieve greater policy coordination in areas such as fiscal policy. Assuming that Europe ultimately succeeds in managing this situation, a stronger union will emerge that will be viewed as more robust and resilient. If, in contrast, Europe were not to be fully successful in charting an effective course, this could have a number of negative implications for the U.S. In particular, there are three possibilities that I would like to highlight for the subcommittee today. First, if the European situation were to, to, to deteriorate, then the euro area would face even more serious fiscal and economic challenges. As a result, growth within the eurozone would weaken, 
and this would lead to less demand for u s goods and services that are exported to Europe from companies and workers here. It is important to recognize that the euro area is the world's second largest economy after the u s and an important trading partner for us. Second, if the European situation were to deteriorate, this could put pressure on the U.S. banking system. The good news is that the U.S. banks are much more robust and resilient than they were a few years ago. Also, the direct exposures of U.S. banks to the countries in Europe that are facing the most intense fiscal challenges are actually quite modest. The bad news is that the exposures of the U.S. banks climb quite sharply when one also considers the exposures to the core European countries and to the overall European banking system. This means that if the crisis were to broaden further and intensify, this could put greater pressure on U.S. banks' capital and liquidity buffers. Third, if the European situation were to deteriorate further, financial markets would likely become more stressed. This could tighten the availability of credit to U.S. households and businesses and this could damage the U.S. recovery and result in slower economic growth and slower job creation. In terms of the actions the official sector in the United States has taken or could take with regard to Europe, I want you to emphasize that any and all such actions pursued by the Federal Reserve are motivated by the mandates that Congress has given the Federal Reserve to promote price stability and maximum sustainable employment here in the United States. When the Federal Reserve was created by Congress in 1913, it was given the responsibility to provide liquidity to the financial system in times of stress in order to shield the economy to the extent possible from the severe effects of financial instability on economic activity and jobs. While the economy and the markets have evolved substantially in the century since then, this basic principle continues to guide our efforts today. In today's globally integrated economy, banks headquartered outside the United States play an important role in providing credit and other financial services in the United States, providing a total of about $900 billion in overall financing within the United States. For these banks to provide U.S. dollar loans, they have to maintain access to U.S. dollar funding. At a time when it is already hard for American families and firms to get the credit they need, we have a strong interest in making sure that these banks can continue to be active in the U.S. dollar markets. One way we can help to support the availability of dollar funding is by engaging in currency swaps with other central banks. This has been used as a policy tool dating back to 1962. Recently, the FOMC decided to use this tool, co cooperating with five other central banks. This action is designed to support financial stability, avoid an unnecessary tightening in financial conditions, and support economic activity and jobs in the U.S. In particular, by reducing the cost of dollar funding by the swap lines last month, we reduced the pressure on banks in Europe to abru abruptly liquidate their U.S. dollar assets. Thus, this step will help to insulate U.S. markets from the pressures in Europe and support the availability of credit to U.S. households and business. In sum, I am hopeful that Europe can effectively address its current challenges. The Federal Reserve is actively and carefully assessing the situation and the potential impact on the economy. We will continue to monitor the situation closely. Thank you for your invitation to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Kamen. Uh, thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, Congressman Cummings, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to talk uh, today to talk about the economic situation in Europe and recent actions taken by the Federal Reserve in response to the situation. The fiscal and financial strains in Europe are spilling over to the United States by restraining our exports, depressing confidence, and adding to pressures on U.S. financial markets. Of note, foreign financial institutions, especially those in Europe, are finding it more difficult to borrow dollars. These institutions make loans to U.S. households and firms, as well as to borrowers in other countries who use those loans to purchase U.S. goods and services. Thus, difficulties borrowing dollars by European institutions may make it harder for U.S. households and firms to get loans and for U.S. businesses to sell their products abroad. Moreover, these disruptions could spill over into U.S. money markets, raising the cost of funding for U.S. financial institutions. To address these potential risks to the United States, on November 30, the Federal Reserve announced, jointly with the European Central Bank and the central banks of Canada, Japan, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom, that it would revise, extend, and expand its swap lines with these institutions. The measures were motivated by the need to ease strains in global financial markets, which, if left unchecked, 
could impair the supply of credit to households and businesses in the United States and impede our economic recovery. Three steps were described in the announcement. First, we reduced the pricing of the dollar swap lines from a spread of 100 basis points over the overnight index swap rate to 50 basis points over that rate. The lower cost enables foreign central banks to reduce the cost of the dollar loans they provide to financial institutions in their jurisdictions. This, in turn, should help alleviate strains in international financial markets and put foreign institutions in a better position to maintain their supply of credit, including to U.S. households and businesses. Second, we extended the closing date for these lines from August 1, 2012 to February 1, 2013, demonstrating that central banks were prepared to work together for a sustained period, if needed, to support global liquidity conditions. Third, we agreed to establish swap lines in the currencies of the other participating central banks. These lines would allow the Federal Reserve to draw foreign currencies and provide them to U.S. financial institutions on a secured basis. U.S. financial institutions are not experiencing any foreign currency liquidity pressures at present, but we judged it prudent to make such arrangements should the need arise in the future. I would like to emphasize that information on the swap lines is fully disclosed on the websites of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I also want to underscore that the swap transactions are safe and secure. First, the swap transactions present no exchange rate or interest rate risk because the terms of each drawing and repayment are set at a time the draw is initiated. Second, each drawing on the swap line must be approved by the Fed, allowing us to closely monitor use of this facility. Third, the foreign currency held by the Fed during the term of the swap provides an important safeguard. Fourth, our counterparties are the foreign central banks, not the private institutions to which the central banks lend. The Fed's history of close interaction with these central banks provides a track record justifying a high degree of trust and cooperation. Finally, the short tenor of the swaps means that positions could be, could be wound down relatively quickly were it judged appropriate to do so. Notably, the Fed has not lost a penny on these swap lines since they were established in 2007. In fact, fees on these swaps have added roughly $6 billion to overall earnings on Fed operations. To conclude, the changes we have made to our swap line arrangements should help maintain the flow of credit to U.S. households and businesses while protecting the U.S. taxpayer. Ultimately, however, the easing of financial strains here and abroad will require concerted action by the European authorities. We are closely monitoring events in Europe and their spillovers to the U.S. economy and financial system. Thank you again for inviting me to appear before you today. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Kamen. Uh, Mr. Sobel. If you'll pull your microphone to your and touch the button in front of you. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, Congressman Cummings, thank you for this opportunity to discuss interests in European economic reform. Over the past year, stresses in Europe have spread to some of Europe's largest economies. The crisis now facing Europe is deeper and more entrenched. Euro area growth is projected by most analysts to be negative this quarter and into early 2012. The OECD, which earlier this year projected Eurozone growth in 2012 of 2 percent, just revised its estimate to 0.2 percent. In the U.S., the pace of recovery has strengthened. But given strong global linkages, Europe's problems are a serious risk for us. The EU buys nearly 20 percent of U.S. goods exports. When European growth slows, U.S. jobs and exports decline. When European financial markets tighten, U.S. banks may be less willing to lend, hurting American businesses that rely on bank credit to grow. When European stocks decline, U.S. equity markets often do as well, hitting the savings, the 401 k programs and wealth of Americans. In states such as New York, North Carolina, and Illinois, over 150,000 jobs and over 250 in Illinois are export-related. Europe has an enormous self-interest in tackling its problems. As President Obama and Secretary Geithner have stated, 
Europe clearly has the capacity and resources to address its crisis. Europe is making progress in putting in place reforms to create the conditions for future growth and build a stronger architecture for fiscal union. The recent European Council agreement represents an important step forward, but more work remains to be done. Supporting Europe is a matter of vital national interest for the well-being of the American economy. Therefore, we are heavily engaged with Europe. Bilaterally, the President is actively engaged. There are extensive contacts with European leaders. Secretary Geithner has traveled to Europe three times in the last three months. Multilaterally, we are working through the G20. Last month in Cannes, France, G20 leaders focus heavily on the European crisis. Mexico is going to chair the G20 in 2012, and promoting a more effective European crisis response is a top priority of the Mexican chair. The IMF is a central institution of the international monetary system. It has well served the world and the United States. It helped the United Kingdom and Italy overcome crises in the 70s, resolve the Latin American debt crisis of the 80s, support Central and Eastern European transition in the early 1990s, and later that decade and uh, earlier the, in the last decade respond to Asian and emerging market crises. It has been a hallmark of my career to see the strong bipartisan support in both the executive and legislative branches for the Fund's role in the global economy. Countries, first and foremost, bear the burden of adjustment. But the IMF can play a role in promoting more orderly adjustment by offering financing to support economic reforms, thus providing breathing space to countries in overcoming their problems with less disruption. When growth plummets in one country, especially a large country, it spills over onto others. In these circumstances, IMF support helps mitigate the impact on the system as a whole. The global financial crisis in 2009 offers a good example. The actions taken by national authorities, coupled with the London summit announcement of significant new IMF support, help stem a massive destabilizing capital outflow from emerging markets. This action was critical in promoting recovery. The IMF is a good investment for the United States. It helps promote global stability. When the, fund lend, sorry, when the fund lends, it does so subject to conditions to help assure it is repaid. Its repayment record is outstanding. When the IMF draws on U.S. resources, we are exposed to the fund's balance sheet, and that balance sheet is solid. The fund is regarded as the world's preferred creditor, meaning that all IMF members agree it gets repaid first. The challenge Europe faces is within the capacity of stronger European members to manage. As European countries strengthen economic reforms and fiscal governance, Europe must also continue mobilizing the requisite resources to put in place a strong and credible firewall commensurate with the scale of the challenge. It must do so quickly with force and determination. The IMF cannot substitute for a strong and credible European firewall in response. The IMF now has a substantial arsenal of for financial resources, almost $400 billion. The administration has been clear with our international partners that we have no intention of seeking additional funding for the IMF. Thank you for inviting me again today. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sobel, and thank you for representing the administration. Uh, I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Let's, let's begin at, at sort of a broad question here for the whole panel. Now, the reason why we're, we're having this discussion is because in the last crisis, policymakers on the Hill were largely caught flat-footed on the actions of the Federal Reserve and the extraordinary, extraordinary actions uh, of the request from Treasury to, for the creation of TARP. American people were surprised by it, too. Looking at this crisis with Europe, I think it is important that we have oversight hearings on the Hill to understand the range of options that you have, uh, both with our central bank um, and the central bank's really main market bank uh, being represented here today, our main market participant, um, to understand the range of options. So uh, let us begin with this question. Um, 
do you believe that european countries are suffering from a liquidity problem or is it a solvency problem and why do you believe that mr dudley Thank you, Chairman uh, McHenry. I think that if you look at Europe as a whole, uh, Europe has the fiscal capacity to solve their problems. Uh, they, the issue is really a political one rather than an economic one. Uh, it's a huge political coordination problem of, of getting 17 countries that share the euro and 27 countries that are part of the uh, European Union to have a meeting of minds to move towards greater fiscal integration. Uh, we are seeing movement in that direction, but it is not happening maybe as fast as, as some of us might, might like. But I do not see uh, Europe as having a, you know, a fiscal uh, insolvency problem as you look across Europe broadly. Uh, their situation fiscally is you know, not, you know, very comparable to ours or, or other, other countries. So if I could add on to those remarks, which, for which I fully agree. Um, Essentially, on, on top of a number of different challenges that Europe faces, it faces a critical problem of confidence. Confidence by global investors in the long-term sustainability of fiscal finances in some European countries. Although, as President Dudley has mentioned, if you look at Europe as a whole, its, it's, its fiscal numbers in terms of debt uh, do not seem out of line. Confidence in the near-term liquidity situation of European countries. Investors want the confidence they know uh, that countries will be able, in, in, you know, before the long term is reached, uh, to secure their necessary funding. And then finally, confidence in the stability of the banking system. So it is incumbent upon European authorities to address all of these issues, and indeed they have taken a number of steps on all three fronts. In the summit announcement that uh, was released last Friday, uh, they uh, you know, suggested measures to uh, bolster long-term fiscal discipline. Uh, they also released additional uh, measures to address the viability of the financial backstop for, you know, for Euro area countries. And then finally, somewhat previous to that, they announced higher capital uh, requirements for banks. So they are taking measures, but a lot more follow-through is needed on them. Details need to be fleshed out. But again, the Europeans have a deep commitment to address the issue, and they should have the resources to be able to do so. Thank you. Mr. Sobel. Uh, I very much agree with uh, uh, Bill Dudley and Steve Kamen. Uh, is, uh, I would underscore fully the point that uh, Europe has the capacity and the resources to address this challenge. Okay. Thank I, you. Is it? Okay. Um, so it is a liquidity, uh, in essence, it is a liquidity challenge the countries face. I, I think that is what you are generally saying. So uh, let me follow up with this. What about European banks? Do they face a, uh, do they say, face a liquidity challenge or a solvency challenge? Mr. Dudley. Yeah, I think it's hard to generalize across you know all the different banks in Europe. I think there are some banks that are in greater degree of difficulty than others. The good news, I think, is that the European authorities are doing the same kind of stress tests that we ran here in the United States, and they're identifying the capital needs that their banks have and are and are basically demanding that their banks raise their capital ratios over the next six months or so. So I think that is a very important step to restore confidence in the European banking system. Now, that is not sufficient. They also have to have confidence in the fiscal sustainability of each country's debt burdens, because the banks hold a lot of sovereign debt. So you really have to solve two problems. You have to basically make sure the banks have enough capital to sort of handle normal stress environments. But you also have to get each country on a sustainable fiscal path so that people are comfortable that the sovereign debt they hold is going to be money good in the end. Just to add briefly to those remarks, all of which, again, I agree with, uh, in general, whenever you have a liquidity problem, either for sovereign governments or for banks, it is because at least some subset of investors have doubts about the solvency as well, even if perhaps a broader class of investors is more confident. So that is why it is critical in this situation where liquidity is at issue to bolster conf confidence and sustainability and long-term solvency. 
And that is why it is critical that the Europeans move ahead uh, on various fronts, both fiscal discipline, financial backstop, and both increasing the transparency of bank situations as well as ensuring that they have sufficient capital. Well, very brief, I briefly, I agree with all this said, and I guess the one only, uh, the only other point I wanted, would like to stress is that I think it's very important for European banks to uh, have strong and adequate capital. If you'd and, speak into the microphone, thank you. Sorry, uh, that it's important that European banks have strong and adequate uh, capital positions and access uh, to funding. Interesting. I, it, artful answers, um, uh, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, uh, Mr. Kamen, thank you. Uh, I think you answered, answered this question because you at least uh, um, touched on the fact that there are doubts about the solvency of uh, many financial institutions. Mr. Dudley, if you'd like to follow up. Yeah, I mean, I, if I could just add to what, what's, what uh, Mr. Kamen said, one of the issues is if investors have even the slightest doubt about a solvency of an institution, even you know one or two percent probability that the institution is, is insolvent, if they are, they are often likely to pull back in terms of their funding. So the liquidity problem comes about not because the institution is definitively insolvent, but just that there is some risk of insolvency. So liquidity and solvency are related, but you can have a liquidity problem without a bank being insolvent. And you can also have a bank with no liquidity problems that is fully insolvent. Well, the thrift crisis in the United States is a good example of, of the latter. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. My time is, is fully expired. But, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday's panel um, uh, talked about those same issues, but they also mentioned that some of these smaller countries uh, might break off and that in the end it could be better for those countries and the situation as a, as a whole for them to do that. Do, do you agree as a panel? I don't have an a, opinion. I, I, don't, I don't feel qualified to offer an opinion on what is in the best interest of countries as for their, you know, for their citizens to decide well, and their leaders well, to decide. Well, not just a political reason, an economic reason, the ability to, to control their own currency and, and well, there, there's, an economic answer. The, you know, the economic answer would be, on one hand, uh, if you can, if you were to, if you were to break away, you could have, a, you could allow your, you could have a currency that depreciated against uh, the the euro, and therefore you could regain your trade competitiveness. That, that's sort of the positive part of the story. The, the 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 negative part of the story, which is very negative, is the fact that you would be very difficult for you to uh, honor all your obligations that you have. Uh, in terms of euro liabilities, and so it would be hugely devastating for any country that left the euro in terms of how their financial system actually was able to perform going forward. The euro system does not contemplate any country exiting. Uh, there is no mechanism to do so. So, you know, we can speculate about what, 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 would, what would exactly happen if a country wanted to leave, but we really don't know the answer to that question. Eurozone is a long-term project of political unification and economic unification and, you know, that dates from World War II. And this is a project that the European authorities still take extremely seriously and are very committed uh, to continuing to perpetuate. Uh, so that is why we are, you know, they are very committed to taking the steps needed to pull it together. To amplify on President Dudley's comments, indeed, while um, on the one hand, uh, if a country or more were to, you know, were contemplating breaking away, that would give it some more latitude in terms of its exchange rate adjustment. But each of these countries is very tightly linked into the financial system of the rest of the euro area, uh, not, you know, in, in both in very complex and technical uh, payments uh, infrastructure ways, as well as our. Uh, more uh, general web of financial relationships and relations of confidence and trust. So any country contemplating breaking away would, you know, could face considerable disruption. Thank you. Uh, building on uh, Mr. Kamen's remarks, I wanted to uh, underscore his point about the commitment uh, in Europe uh, to the euro. And Europe is moving forward with closer integration and, is, and the institutional underpinnings for the euro area. And as uh, Mr. Kamen said, this is a, pro is a project. 
But I think it's worth uh, thinking uh, about the following. Um, Europe has uh, made progress, uh, considerable progress in this regard. The countries of Europe are undertaking considerable reforms. Uh, it's a difficult environment, but, but if you look at what is happening in Italy and Spain and Portugal and Ireland and Greece, there are major for reforms that are being uh, uh, implemented. Um, Last week at the European Council meeting, there were major steps made in terms of uh, bolstering the fiscal compact and steps towards uh, a much more rigorous fiscal system for the future. Over the last uh, period, they've created the European Financial Stability Fund and now the European Stability Mechanism, putting substantial resources at stake. I think if you thought back two years ago, you would have said that these reforms were unimaginable, uh, that Europe would have undertaken them, and yet Europe has responded uh, fairly forcefully. Um, and I, I think I just want to underscore that I think uh, it, it does show the commitment of Euro European leadership uh, to the Euro, and uh, I wanted to reemphasize that it's very important that uh, Europe succeed, and it's very important to the United States that Europe succeed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dudley, very quickly, uh, you talked about the loans that we have to uh, countries like Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain being relatively small exposure. I, I believe the Center uh, for American Progress put that number at about $113 billion. Um, but you did say that. Uh, to the Eurozone as a whole, it is a much larger exposure. I mean, what figure becomes significant in your mind? I mean, and, and what happens to the banks in the, in the United States uh, with that $113 billion? Uh, I mean, how are they protected at all? I am not uh, familiar with that particular number. And I, I, would, I would be, that sounds like, a, uh, that sounds bigger than what my understanding of the U.S. bank exposures are. Could, you, if, could someone find out? What that number is, we'd, we'd be happy to report back to us in, in terms of back to you. this: the, the but, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and then the rest of the eurozone. But your, your, your but your point is well taken. That as you if you as you broaden the exposures out to the Europe as a whole, they become very very large. And op, and that what that means is that if the European system were to get into difficulty, there clearly would be uh, consequences for us here in the United States. Okay. If you, again, if you could get back to us and with the, a realistic figure for the, those countries and the Eurozone as a whole, and if anyone, uh, my time has expired, but if anyone could now or later sort of explain their understanding um, of what happens to American banks in that regard. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Dudley, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, opening statement, you gave a speech at the uh, United States Military Academy at West Point during which you indicated that our uh, economy continues to face significant uh, downside risks, uh, mostly related to stress in the Eurozone. Obviously, uh, our hearing today has been called to consider the Eurozone crisis, and I appreciate your insights on that issue. However, you also spoke of another significant downside risk confronting our economy, and that is continuing the continuing foreclosure crisis. You even stated that obstacles to mortgage refinancing are so severe that they are undermining the impact of monetary policy. <clears throat> In your address, you identified a number of measures that might comprise a comprehensive approach to housing policy, including the elimination of barriers to refinancing and measures that will enable borrowers who are underwater on their loans, but continue to make their monthly payments to earn accelerated principal reduction over time. Further, you stated, and I quote, I am encouraged by the recent decision by the FHFA to make it easier for certain borrowers with high, high loan-to-value ratios to refinance. You went on to say, I hope this initial step will be followed by others that collectively move in the direction of stabilizing house prices. I believe this would not just be good economic policy, but it would also extremely be beneficial for taxpayers who now effectively own 
the credit risk of those home loans guaranteed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, end of quote. I completely re agree with your policy prescriptions. However, when FH, <coughs> FHA Acting Director DeMarco appeared before our committee, he testified that he has concluded that the use of principal reduction within the context of a loan modification is not going to be the least cost approach for the taxpayer. We have asked Mr. DeMarco to provide the details of this analysis, but he has not yet provided us with that information. These are my questions. You, uh, given that, as you said in your statement, taxpayers effectively own credit risk of loans guaranteed by the GSEs, do you believe that enabling borrowers with loans owned or guaranteed by the GSEs who are underwater to earn principal reduction would be in the long-term interest of the taxpayers? That's number one. I want to ask my question because I want to make sure I get them all in. Two, we have looked at, in detail at the FHA refinancing proposal you re referenced, and even the FHA estimates <clears throat> that this new program may help at the most 900,000 additional borrowers. Uh, is a program that helps 900,000 borrowers adequate to contribute to a stabilization of house prices, or do you believe? that significantly greater numbers of borrowers need to be helped to yield the stabilization of house prices? And finally, how is the failure to stabilize the housing market and help borrowers who are underwater undermining the impact of the monetary policies implemented by the Federal Reserve, and what are the consequences for our economy? Thank you, Congressman Cummings. Let me take your last question first. How is the, uh, the problems in the housing sector undermining the effectiveness of monetary policy? It is undermining the effectiveness of the monetary policy because the decline in long-term rates is not f uh, being fully taken advantage by households in, in terms of their ability to refinance their mortgages. So people have mortgages that are 5.5%, you know, 6.5%, six six who can't refinance because the value of their homes have fa has fallen sufficiently far that their mortgages are now worth more than the value of the home, and so they can't e re easily refinance. Uh, this obviously makes monetary policy less effective because if they could refinance, they would get the advantages of, of those lower mortgage rates, which would put, put more money in their in their pocket. Uh, the second thing I would say is, you know, is it, to the extent that you could uh, do some of these things for housing, uh, it has truly two sort of benefits. One. Uh, if you could stabilize housing prices, if, if, if you took these steps, I think you could stabilize housing prices. And if you stabilize housing prices, I think you would actually start to see more demand for housing. And if you saw more demand for housing, then housing prices would start to go up. And that would actually uh, uh, bolster household confidence, because house, house, houses are a very large component of, uh, of the household balance sheet. So if home prices are stable or rising, people are going to feel a little bit better about the outlook, not just for housing, but also about their own willingness to go out and, and, and spend and consume. So we think this would be very favorable uh, for, for the housing sector. Now, in terms of your two questions on principal reduction, we think that you can devise, devise a program uh, that, that for, for, for home buyers that are, have mortgages that are underwater to incent them to continue to pay on those mortgages by giving them some program of principal reduction. Now, obviously, the devil's in the details, so you have to have good program design. But we are confident that one can do one can design a program which would be net beneficial, net net positive to the to the taxpayer. Um, in terms of the HARP program that you were talked about, the nine hundred thousand, you know, obviously, you know, every bit helps. Uh, obviously, I, I'd like to see the program broader uh, so that more households can participate because that would be uh, helpful in stabilizing the housing sector and it would make monetary policy uh, more effective. Thank you very much. Ms. Maloney for five minutes. Well, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome Mr. Dudley. New York is so proud of him and his service to our country and, and to welcome all of, the, all of the participants today and, of course, my colleagues. I, I, I um, would like to ask uh, Mr. Dudley um, um, what would be the impact on the U.S. economy and American taxpayers uh, if Europe experiences a deep depression. Well, thank you for the kind words, Congressman Mahoney. Uh, obviously, if Europe went into a deep recession, there would be significant consequences to the United States. 
The first consequence would be in terms of our ability to sell goods and services to, to Europe. Uh, that would, we would have trouble exporting uh, to Europe, and that would have consequences for employment uh, and manufacturing here in, in the United States. The second uh, transmission channel would be back to our U.S. banking system. As we have discussed earlier, U.S. banks do have a large exposure to Europe, and so if the European economy is doing very poorly, as you suggest, uh, so clearly that would put stress on U.S. banks, capital, and liquidity, and so that could have implications for credit availability here in the United States. Uh, and third, if Europe were to go into a, a deep recession, uh, this, this would also be, I think, quite uh, uh, challenging for financial markets, for the U.S. equity market and for other financial markets. And so that also would uh, have negative consequences to the household wealth uh, and to consumer confidence. So I think that would also affect the uh, U.S. economy. Well, some economists are predicting that there, there will be a breakup of the euro. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Mr. Kamen and Mr. Dudley, um, how would the breakup of the euro affect the U.S. economy? And do you believe that will happen or won't happen, starting with Mr. Kamen and then Mr. Dudley? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Congressman, Congresswoman Maloney. Um, so uh, in reference to that, and as I said uh, earlier, the European's authorities are deeply committed to um, their project of political and economic unification and deeply committed to the perpetuation of the Eurozone, which means in turn that they understand the deep seriousness of their current situation and they, are, they plan to take the steps needed. Well, then why aren't they taking the proper uh, necessary steps to properly combat the crisis? Uh, many economists say they have enough resources uh, to combat it themselves. Do you think they need a TARP-like approach? Uh, uh, if they won't combat their own political problems, should we come in and handle their problem for them? Well, it is certainly not for us to handle their problem mm -hmm. for them. And they are very cognizant of their problems. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, announced a number of steps uh, in the past week and then in the past few months to address their problem. A, uh, as announced last Friday, a new set of disciplines on fiscal behavior uh, to raise confidence investors on their long-term sustainability. Well, what, uh, what does their actions bear on the actions that have already been taken by the Treasury and the Fed? And do you support the actions that Treasury and Fed have taken? Well, I certainly support the actions that the Fed and Treasury, since they yeah. pay my mm -hmm. salary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Team player. But, but just, <laughs> <laughs> but but, but uh, I, I think the way to think of it is the European authorities have their plate uh, full. They, they have to do certain things they need in order to stabilize the situation in Europe. Our well, job Well, my time is running out, and I would like to also hear from Mr. Dudley. I only have a few second, seconds left. So, so think, Mr. Dudley, would I you respond? I would I say two things. One, I the break, up the, break up of the euro, what would that mean to what would that what, what, well, what would the impact this be? This is not something that uh, I anticipate for the reasons that Mr. Yeah. Kramer said. I think the European leadership is fully committed to the European Union, and they are going to take the steps that they need to move towards greater fiscal integration. As I said earlier, it is a political problem. Uh, and so maybe they are not moving as fast as some of us might like, but they are moving, I think, in the, in the, in the right direction. The second thing I would just stress is, you know, this, all the things that the Federal Reserve has done with respect to the foreign exchange drops, this isn't about helping Europe. This is about helping ourselves. This is about ensuring the flow of credit to U.S. households and businesses. We're doing this for ourselves. My time has expired. I thank my colleague. Uh, good questions, very good questions. I will begin a second round uh, of questions. Um, look, I, I, to get into the, a very specific question uh, following up with uh, Ms. Maloney, let us say Greece w withdraws from the, uh, from the euro. Do you have the scenarios? Uh, is that part of the scenarios that you, you worked through? Uh, and would that have, uh, you know, so walk through that process. Yeah, I don't think the, we would characterize that we work through specific, you know, you know, horrible scenarios surrounding Europe. What we do instead you don't do go through do is, is do contingency planning to make sure that the Federal Reserve System can handle very stressful environments and to ensure that the U.S. banking system can handle very stressful, stressful environments, regardless of the source of that stress. So, for example, the U.S. right now is we're in the process. The Federal Reserve is right now in the process of putting the U.S. banks through a very severe stress test. 
and, and that exercise, which, you know, and that stress might come from Europe, uh, but, but it could come from some other source. So yeah, I, I think our job is to make sure that the U.S. banks can withstand bad, bad, a bad economic environment regardless of the source of that, of that stress. Okay. Mr. Sobel, we'll begin with you. Play out the scenario for the next six, to, six months to a year. What does uh, the administration, what does the Treasury, um, uh, what do they foresee uh, happening with this euro crisis over the next six months to a year? So far, so good. Um, as I was saying earlier, I I think Europe is making progress. Uh, they have put in place a number of reforms, and they will undoubtedly continue to uh, further move ahead with reforms. Um, Europe is uh, developing its uh, firewall to provide time and space while the countries are uh, putting in place reforms and as these take hold. And we we will uh, remain fully engaged and continue to work with them, continue to support uh, them staying on the uh, reform path. Uh, and I think that uh, they are, the Europeans are very closely monitoring the situation. Uh, they have talked about um, having a review of the adequacy of their uh, financial resources and backstopping. Uh, in March um, to uh, ensure what I think is important, which is that uh, governments have uh, adequate uh, access to affordable financing and banks are, uh, and also that banks uh, have adequate funding. So that is your view over the next six months to a year? I think it's, it's a process we're, and Okay. We're Mr. Kamen, I will ask you the same question. I hope you have a better answer. Well. Um, obviously, it is extremely difficult to plot out. The that is why I am asking the Federal Reserve. So we're very, so <laughs> you run through tough scenarios, I understand. Yeah. But play, play this out for the next six months to a year. What do the American people, uh, what could they expect to see? Give us the range here. Much, a great deal depends on how European authorities follow through on the commitments that they have already stated. They have a very full agenda of items that they need to work on. The Friday summit, the last Friday summit, okay, involved an EU or intergovernmental agreement among at least the 17 Eurozone countries, plus other additional countries in the EU but not in the Eurozone, to work out, to agree on a system of financial disciplines, to consider a bilateral loan by the Europe to the IMF, okay, in order to facilitate their lending in order to move up uh, the timing of that's the history. So let's that's not, go through well, the that, that, those are the items that are on the Europeans' agenda. And so what we look forward to over the next weeks and months is their implementation, their agreement on those items, which will in some cases require their you know ratification by the member states and their implementation of those. And that is the process that we are looking forward. And if they move through decisively on that and put these measures in place. There is some chance, um, or perhaps a good chance, it's hard to know, that eventually that will build the confidence needed and we'll see the crisis easing. If they do not succeed in the near term in achieving that type of progress and follow through, and that disheartens mar markets and investors, then we can see more adverse outcomes. But that's basically the framework we're using to look at the next uh, period, is, is the progress being made by European authorities. Mr. Dudley. I agree with uh, what Steve uh, said. Uh, you know, the devil is now in the details. So we have a broad outline of, of the way forward, but now we have to actually see the details of, of how they are going to implement it, and then we have to see the political process support it. Uh, and that is really you know, going to be critical over the next three to six months. So you are talking structurally. Let us talk about the banks, the European financial institutions. Well, I think that the important thing here to recognize is that, is that if the European countries put their fiscal houses in order, then the banking problems in Europe become much more manageable. Because what the, what, why investors are worried about European banks is in large part because they are worried about the sovereign debt holdings those banks have. So if the European countries put their fiscal houses in order, this will go a long way to solving the European banking uh, situation. 
that how you see it, Mr. Kamen? Uh, very much so. Uh, in addition to that, so that is, a, that is the critical challenge the European authorities must meet. At the same time, there is a parallel process that will go on for the European banks as they strive to meet their heightened capital requirements. And there are some risks there that have been much talked about in the media about how they will achieve their higher uh, requirements. Will they do it through deleveraging? Will they do it through raising capital? And that is another process that we will be following closely. With that, uh, my time has expired. Uh, uh, Mr. Cummings, a full committee uh, ranking member, is recognized. Mr. Dudley and Mr. Kamen, the uh, Federal Reserve stepped up a couple of years ago uh, during the U.S. financial crisis and acted as a lender of last resort to the banks. In fact, the Fed played a central role in containing the crisis and stabilizing the American economy. Why was it important for the Central Bank of the United States to intervene during the financial crisis? Well, I think during the financial crisis, what we saw was a complete loss of confidence in private sector financial firms to engage with one another. And so it was very, very important for the Federal Reserve to provide a backstop form of funding so that people were more, more willing to actually come back into the market and start to engage with one, with, with one another. Do you agree with that, Mr. Kamen? Pardon me? I was asking if he agreed with you. Uh, absolutely. That's, uh, the problem was basically a breakdown of money markets, and as a result of that, a breakdown in the supply of credit to U.S. households and firms, as well as those around the world. And that posed a dire threat to the global economy and the U.S. economy, and that's why we intervened. Well, during the 2008 financial crisis, the Fed proactively took steps to prevent panic and acted as a lender of last resort. The United States had and has a long-term fiscal problem, but that did not prevent the Fed from taking action to address the immediate financial crisis at hand. But the European Central Bank is not doing that in Europe. According to testimony we heard yesterday, the policies that the ECB is pursuing will aggravate the potential for a default. According to Desmond Latchman, and I quote, there is, very, this, <clears throat> there is the very real risk that continuing to supply substantial fiscal tightening will lead to a very deep economic recession. A deep recession would make it very difficult for countries to reduce their budget deficits and would undermine their political willingness to remain within the euro. Yesterday, Reuters reported that Ireland's European Affairs Minister, Lucinda Creighton, thinks that the ECB should become a lender of last resort during the European crisis. Do you think that the ECB should, should let up on austerity and start being a lander of last resort? I will take the answer from all three of you on that. I think the ECB is being actually quite aggressive in providing, being a lender of last resort to the European banking system. Uh, they have uh, now introduced a three-year uh, a lending facility where they will provide loans for, three, for a three-year period, which is an unprecedented length of, of time. They broaden the collateral eligibility requirements so that it is more easy for European banks to bring collateral to the ECB to get funding. Where, 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 the, where the issue is in Europe in, with, with regard to the European Central Bank is their ability to buy primary debt issuance from the sovereign countries. And this is prohibited by treaty. It is prohibited by treaty for the ECB to buy the sovereign debt issued by the countries in the primary market. And some people are arguing that they should sort of do it anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the Mario Draghi, who is the head of the ECB, points, I think, correctly to the treaty which prohibited such activity. But I think in terms of backstopping their banks, they are actually providing a lender of last resort function for their banks. Um, I I agree with everything President Dudley said, and I would just add a couple of more points. Uh, first of all, uh, in responding to the decline in economic activity that we have seen in Europe in recent months, uh, the ECB has indeed lowered uh, their policy interest rate uh, by you know, a couple of times uh, of 25 basis points apiece. So they are taking actions uh, to loosen monetary policy in response to financial and economic strains. Additionally, while they are indeed, as President Dudley has said, um, uh, prohibited uh, from buying sovereign bonds directly uh, in the primary market uh, from governments, they are not prohibited from buying bonds in the secondary market, in other words, buying them from other holders of this debt. And, in fact, they have been doing so for some time. 
Uh, so they are uh, very much committed to indeed acting as a lender of last resort for banks and for supporting the European economy in the ways that they view as within their purview. Um, but a lot of the heavy lifting will have to be done by governments uh, and fiscal authorities uh, at, you know, in order to fully address the strains on the system. Well, Mr. Kamen, do you think that it will be necessary for the ECB to purchase uh, country bonds to uh, stabilize? Well, they already are purchasing uh, uh, bonds, mm -hmm. as I have said, in the secondary market, and that, that appears to have been helpful to some degree. Mr. Sobel. Uh, Congressman, when, when one works at the U.S. Treasury, one is trained not to talk about uh, monetary policies by <laughs> other central banks. So even if I agreed with everything my colleagues have said, I would only say that the ECB has played an important role in ensuring European financial st stability, and uh, we look forward to it continuing to do so. Just going back to you, Mr. Kamen, do you, do you think the ECB needs to increase the, pur the purchases? Of the country bonds, I I, uh, I think uh, you know much depends on how uh, both how the economic situation evolves going forward, and in particular how European authorities uh, put follow through on the announcements they've already made. So just as, uh, but don't you think that would help to avert the crisis, a potential crisis? Well, I think that, as I say, ultimately what is required to, to avert uh, the crisis and get it under control is very concerted, uh, concerted action uh, by European authorities. Uh, and certainly a fiscal element has to be critical. Uh, the ECB undoubtedly will play some role, but what that role will be uh, is, is not for me you know, to judge on, and, and, but, but there will have to be some role. Thank you. Uh, I thank the ranking member. Mr. Gowdy from South Carolina. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I want to thank you for your uh, leadership on this issue, which frankly is unparalleled. And, and while I had a series of questions, including whether or not the uh, breakup of the euro could result in a net devaluation of the resulting bank of basket of currencies, uh, as I have sat here for part of this morning and heard your questions, I think uh, I am inclined to give you my time so you uh, can more I'm fully. I am inclined to take it. And I, I, I would like you to more fully develop that and any other ideas that you think are, uh, are of the moment. So I would yield to the gentleman from, New, from North Thank Carolina. You. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, I asked uh, earlier about uh, the, this notion of w what happens with Greece. And, uh, and I, I certainly respect the fact that the Federal Reserve doesn't, uh, in the Treasury, uh, you don't want to be out there saying that. You know, you've you've cooked this into the books, um, so to speak. You you sort of priced in this, and um, and and uh, the extension of the swap lines is sort of in anticipation of uh, of uh, of of Greece defaulting. Either uh, whether or not the term default is actually used. Um, you know, there is some notion that uh, that what will happen with Greece, with our panel of experts yesterday, is that. Um, you know, Greece would basically, uh, with an ongoing process uh, with other uh, Euro participants, um, have a very significant write down that is, in essence, a default, uh, but through some other uh, of uh, other terminology. Therefore, CDS contracts aren't uh, aren't triggered as we've just seen with this last round. So. Let's let's price this in, okay? Let's say that that process happens. What we've seen is is the euro put the eurozone put in place policies for Portugal, Spain, and Greece that appear to be failing. So, what would what would it take? What would you uh, suggest it would take in order uh, for uh, Spain and Italy to not go through those same uh, challenges uh, based on the existing policy? If those policies di aren't quite working with Portugal, Greece, uh, and Ireland, what makes you believe that they would work uh, with Spain and Italy, Mr. Dudley? Well, first, I'm not sure that they aren't working. I think uh, I think that uh, you know, it, it, it's too soon to say exactly whether these countries are going to be able to sustain the fiscal adjustment that they have put in place. I think the the outlook is different for different countries. 
The second thing I would say is that the swaps really had no, have nothing to do with whether Greece leaves the euro or not. Uh, the swaps were put in place for a very different reason. We were seeing that U European banks were having a difficulty obtaining dollar funding, and as a consequence of that, they were liquidating their dollar book of assets here in the United States. So this was tightening credit availability in the United States, which was going to have a direct impact if it was allowed to continue on U.S. households and businesses. So the swaps were really about the funding, the ability of European banks to obtain dollar funding and the consequences of that on the United States. Whether Greece leaves the euro or doesn't leave the euro, I think that was immaterial to our decision-making on, on, on the swaps. So the policies in Portugal, uh, Ireland, and Greece you believe are working? I am not going to make an assessment about how well okay, the individual countries are doing. Okay, because their debt to doing. GDP ratio is but, worse now than it was before the policies were put in place. I, I would say two things. If, as you go from the peripheral countries to the core, the debt uh, challenges become much more manageable. In other words, if you look at Spain or you look sure. at Italy and you look at their debt to GDP ratio and you look at their deficit to GDP ratio, they have to do uh, substantially less than what Greece has had to do. Uh, and so I think that from, our, from my perspective, uh, you know, what Spain and Italy need to do is completely achievable. It is completely achievable. The question is just the political will to implement the fiscal austerity on a reasonable time frame and convince market participants that they can actually do so. You know, one of the problems we have right now is it is going to take time for countries to implement their programs, and therefore it is going to take time for market participants to be convinced that they actually are on a sustainable path. And so the question is, how do you get from here to then when they have actually had a chance to implement their programs? Mr. Kamen, you, you mentioned money market funds uh, in, in your testimony. Uh, please ex expand upon that. Uh, what, what is the, uh, you know, in the downturn, in the in the financial crisis of 08, 09, uh, the uh, the federal government stepped in and in essence insured, well, directly insured money market funds. So there's a belief in the in the uh, among consumers in America that these are protected assets. When in at, when in actuality they actually are in the market. They have just performed very well over a very long period of time, and only one has broken the buck in, you know, the last, uh, in the last generation, we should say. So explain, to, uh, ex if you will, just expand, uh, expound upon uh, this money market exposure and why these swap lines pertain. I would be glad to. Um, the, um, so um, first, uh, money market funds obviously are an extremely important uh, provider of dollar liquidity. Uh, both to U.S. financial markets and financial markets around the world. Uh, so many European banks, uh, you know, rely heavily uh, on lending and investing by uh, U.S. money market funds in these banks, CDs, commercial paper, and the like. And that's an important source of the dollar funding they use to, in order to provide lending to firms and businesses both in the United States and abroad. Um, uh, by the same token. Uh, lending uh, to European institutions comprises a large fraction of the U.S. money market funds portfolio. Now, the money market funds have been substantially reducing you know, their exposure to the most vulnerable uh, so-called peripheral European economies. So that is no longer much of a source of risk. But that said, they still have very substantial exposures to the banks of core European economies. So in the event that, so that poses a number of risks. First, in the event uh, that the uh, financial strains in Europe were to intensify, uh, money market funds would naturally be expected to further reduce uh, you know, their exposure to those banks, which would increase their financial straits. And as well, and this is a problem that's received much attention, um, you know, investor, U.S. investors in money market funds, you know, might be inclined to take some of their funds out that could put the money market funds in a difficult situation. Uh, this is something that, of course, we at the Fed uh, and other agencies are very alert to, and that's been an important consideration for the FSOC, you know, um, you know, Financial Stability Oversight Committee, and they are, and they are working on, you know, all, all regulatory agencies are interested in this, and, of course, the SEC has the primary regulatory authority. Uh, you know, for, for these money market funds, and they are working through uh, some, some reforms. So the swap line is about direct American exposure in, in that regard. 
the swap line is about uh, exposure in that regard and many regards. Its point is to make sure, uh, you know, that you're, you know, to help European and other foreign institutions get the dollar funding that they need in order to continue providing credit uh, both around the world and to U.S. households and firms. And, and by doing that, we strengthen the liquidity position of these institutions. And by doing that, we make them appear to be safer investments for money market funds and other investors. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Maloney. Thank you. Um, what is the single most important thing that uh, Europe uh, could do to prevent a banking crisis here in the United States? Mr. Sobel, Mr. Kamen, Mr. Dudley. Well, let me, uh, let me address the question of what is the single most important thing Europe can do. And I think that it is clear that Europe needs to pursue a comprehensive strategy to overcome the crisis. This is going to, and, and what I think needs to be done in a nutshell is the countries have to reform, they have to stick to their reform plans, and it's going to be about implementation. It's not going to be easy, but uh, that is a first pre prerequisite for uh, restoring confidence. Um, secondly, uh, at the European level, there needs to be further progress in strengthening the foundations of the Eurozone. Uh, we saw that with uh, last week some uh, steps with regard to the uh, fiscal compact. And third, as Mr. Dudley was suggesting a minute ago, it takes time for reforms to take hold. So they have to get from here to there. And I think this is, very, uh, this is where the issue of the European firewall uh, comes into place. It is a firewall that has to be strong and credible, and it needs to be there uh, as a backstop to ensure that countries uh, have access to affordable financing at sustainable rates. And it's important that banks in Europe have adequate capital uh, and access uh, to uh, affordable funding. Mr. Kamen, Mr. Dudley. Oh, I very much agree with what Mr. Sobel said, and I guess I would just uh, put it succinctly. There, there, there is no single magic bullet. The European authority, you know, what's needed in order to address this uh, crisis is decisive action and follow through by European authorities. On all Do you agree with uh, uh, the majority's witness, Mr. Lackman, said that uh, Europe may need a TARP program? Do you agree with his statement? I'm sorry, but I'm not even sure what that might mean. So, uh, well, I think you know what a TARP program is. Well, you think they need a TARP program or not? Well, let's put it this way. If, if by that you mean uh, sort of injection by European authorities mm -hmm. into the banks of, of, of that continent, uh, that, that represents part okay, of the uh, agreement that was uh, concluded about a month and a half ago by European authorities, that they would raise the capital standards for banks in Europe, and if those were not met, then governments might inject in some form or another. So, so I would say that that could be that's already kind of in the cards as part of it. But that is that by itself is not enough. They have to work on bolstering the fiscal position of the government. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dudley. Any comments? I, I agree with. time to show that you can get there, and you need the countries to do what they have to do in terms of demonstrating that they are committed to fiscal, to getting their fiscal house in order on a sustainable long-term basis. And lastly, some of these countries also need to take steps to improve their competitiveness. In other words, they have to do structural reforms to their labor markets, et cetera, to improve their competitiveness, because it is not just a fiscal problem, it is also a competitiveness problem for some of these countries. Well, well, I would like to um, comment on a, a strategy that came out of the 2009 G20 where they agreed to triple the fund's lending capacity. And in response to that for the IMF, uh, our Congress approved a $108 billion line of credit uh, to the IMF. And a, uh, the, some Republicans have come forward with a proposal or legislation that would rescind 
the imf's authority to spend any of this 108 billion contribution to um, the imf's european uh, strategy uh, so i'd like to ask uh, um, let's we'll start with you, Mr. Sobel. Can you explain some of the terms and conditions that are associ associated with the IMS uh, financial assistance to the nation, and uh, uh, and what does IMF's assistance really signal to the rest of the world or to other uh, financial backstops to to help in this situation? Thank you. In my testimony, I indicated that um, the IMF lending plays a very vital role in the system in helping countries. When countries face uh, stresses and difficulties, uh, they frequently come to the IMF against the background of uh, loss of access to financing, which uh, imposes a very deep uh, stress on the society and the economy as a whole. What IMF uh, comes in and does is it works with countries to develop a more uh, orderly path to restore growth and vitality. They do so first by developing economic conditions. Uh, the money is uh, tightly overseen. Their quarterly uh, performance criteria on fiscal and various other indicators to make sure that the country is moving on a track that will uh, restore it to stability. Uh, in addition, the fund uh, provides uh, financing, and uh, that allows uh, the country, as I was saying, uh, to uh, more orderly, make a more orderly transition towards uh, resumed growth. Now, that is in the country itself. But when a country has problems, especially a large one, it has ramifications for the neighbors. It can have ramifications for the global economy, as we saw in, in, in 2009. And so the logic of IMF assistance is not only to help the country restore stability, but it is also to lessen the impact on the global economy, which is very much in our interest. And as we indicated earlier, that from the vantage point of the United States, one of the problems is uh, from a deteriorating situation in Europe is that it hurts U.S. exports, it hurts mm -hmm. uh, U.S. growth, um, it constrains financing to businesses, it hurts our, our stock markets, our uh, 401ks and the like. So the fund support for the global economy can be very vital in helping promote uh, international financial stability. Would the IMF alone be able to fix the crisis, uh, Mr. Kamen? Um, I'm not sure if I'm. Mm -hmm. The Treasury is the main uh, agency there, so I think it will be yeah, okay. available if you don't mind. Um, we have uh, said very uh, many times that the uh, Europe has the primary responsibility for addressing its problems. It has the capacity and resources to address its problems. Uh, we have welcomed the fiscal actions they have taken. We have welcomed the actions they have taken to put in place a stronger governance framework. And we have welcomed the creation of the firewall. We have been very clear that the IMF cannot substitute for a strong and credible European firewall and a strong and decisive and forceful European response to the crisis. What would happen if the Republican legislation passed that uh, denies the funding from the United States to the IMF? Uh, so, uh, in my view, um, the IMF helps serve U.S. interests and our interest in sustaining global financial stability, which is important to the health of our economy. So again, Europe has to act. But the IMF can be a tool for uh, helping achieve a sounder world economy. 
and we want the IMF to have the resources uh, to be able to do its job and perform. Um, in 2009, Congress approved a $100 billion increase in our commitment to the new arrangements uh, to borrow, as well as a modest uh, $8 billion increase in our quota. And the fund has long had a backstopping role for the global economy. I mean, this, the, the backstopping role of the fund through this NAB, the NAB, it used to be called something else, the GAB, but it goes back to 1962, uh, which is when the swap lines were created, as Bill was mentioning earlier. So this is vital to uh, promoting global stability. So uh, my view is that if we were to withdraw our funding, um, I think it would harm market confidence. I think it would weaken U.S. leadership in the institutions. Um, I think it would put our standing in the fund in jeopardy, and mm -hmm. uh, I think it would cause the fund to look to others to play a more influential role in its operations and activities. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that it's, uh, our support for the IMF is very important. Right. Thank you. My time has expired. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, the Vice Chairman, uh, Mr. Gint of New Hampshire, is uh, now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sobel, when I was here earlier during your opening uh, remarks, I thought I heard you say that uh, the IMF has a very good rate of uh, reimbursement, of repayment. So I, I, wanted, I wanted you to just clarify that for me, and then I wanted to ask you a follow-up question. Thank you. Um, the IMF, in my perspective, is a very unique institution. So let me just cite three factors. One, as I was just describing, it can set the macroeconomic conditions for a loan to a country. That helps the country get back to growth, but it also uh, can help ensure that the country gets back to growth and through this quarterly monitoring process. And that helps ensure that the fund's resources are safeguarded. Secondly, the fund is a preferred creditor state. Uh, so everybody in the world, all countries, all members of the fund, recognize that the fund is first in line to be repaid. And its repayment record is just excellent. Um, thirdly, it has a strong balance sheet, a very strong balance sheet. It has good reserves, and again, it has this ability to set these conditions. It has this ability. It has preferred creditor status. And that is not only good for the members of the fund, but another dimension of this is that when we, when the IMF draws on our resources and provides it to another country, some people think, you know, you're exposed to that country. In fact, we are exposed to the balance sheet of the fund. When the fund draws resources from us, we get a liquid, interest-bearing, and cashable claim on the IMF and its strong balance sheet. So those were the reasons that I was outlining that I feel that the IMF uh, is uh, a that, that our claims in the IMF are fully secure. The, the reason I ask is I believe it was today's Washington Post article, um, and I don't know if you have seen it yet, but it was entitled, Will U.S. Taxpayers Be on the Hook for Bailing Out Europe? There is a quote from Anthony Sanders, uh, who is a professor at George Mason University, who said, I would expect the $100 billion, which is money, I, I believe that is uh, a line of credit that we have issued to the IMF, I would expect the $100 billion to be used and not be paid back is what he said. Um, so I'm, the, I'm curious about two things. Number one, why uh, all of a sudden there would be this shift in, in an expectation of it not to be paid, paid back, number one. Number two, the statements that have been made by uh, Mr. Geithner 
followed up by the President of the United States, uh, suggesting that no additional funds should go to the IMF. I am particularly curious to know if that line of credit should be withdrawn, in your opinion. Uh, first of all, I, I think that the action taken by Congress in approving the $100 billion NAB line in 2009, which was signed into law shortly thereafter, was a vital step. It was uh, the announcement of the NAB was instrumental in contributing to strengthening global stability in 2009. It was very visible at the time. Um, and I strongly support, uh, we strongly supported that action. The, uh, you you again, would, you would agree, fully, though, that we are somewhere different today than 2009, or, or Europe is somewhere different today than they were in 2009? Absolutely. Uh, I think the point, my point is that we want the fund to have the resources to do its job. The NAB is part of that, and we strongly back that. I, again, uh, am firmly of the belief that our claims in the IMF are extremely secure. I think the repayment record of the fund is stellar. Be happy to sit with your staff and document that to them. Okay, I, I know that that quote. So I so I, I just want to say we we will be repaid, um, and the NAB line so far the IMF has drawn six billion from dollars from our NAB line. Um, let me just get to my, I, I know that Professor Sanders made that um, statement yesterday in, in testimony, so it, it is something that I would probably want to follow up with you on. The final question I do have is, in the cases of Greece and Ireland and Portugal, their debt to GDP ratio after receiving assistance packages, uh, I believe, actually increased or rose. Um, so while I understand your point about uh, the impact globally that IMF has, it doesn't seem that countries get the point that after they receive a loan or a bailout, they are not fixing their, their debt uh, to GDP ratio, which is, quite frankly, the same problem we are having here in the United States, in my view. So I, I, in, in, the, in, the short, in a real short amount of time, can you tell me how one would argue that bailouts are even working if that GDP to debt ratio is increasing, not decreasing? Congressman, I look forward to working with you after this hearing. Um, so when growth has slowed in these economies, that has had the effect of uh, depressing uh, revenues uh, and Automatic stabilizers exist in these economies that boost. You could turn on your mic and pull it to your face. That'd be good. Okay. So, <coughs> so basically, this tends to push deficits up in the in the short term. Meanwhile, these countries are taking actions to bring their fiscal houses in order against mm -hmm. the background of the cyclical uh, downturn uh, in the uh, fiscal position. This. The point I made is that the IMS support provides a more orderly transition to uh, restoration of growth, and the fund closely monitors and reviews the performance to make sure the country is getting on track for its So, okay, and I, I, would, the, would the chair yield an additional 30 seconds? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what you are saying, I understand what you are saying. You are saying that there, the, the debt in the short term is going up, but these countries are taking longer term measures to stabilize their economy, to improve their economy, have a pro growth economy, um, reduce expenditures. Can you tell me then, in your opinion, if that is the, if that's what we think should be a standard for us to be loaning money to the IMF, are we, in fact, as, our, as a nation, imposing that same standard on ourselves? Is the President of the United States imposing that same standard on our country? Congressman, I uh, think the I didn't come here today to. 
Well, there's a tie between Europe and the United States, isn't there? I think the President has uh, proposed a bold fiscal plan. If you'll please put your microphone, Georgia, we cannot hear you. I, I, I think the administration has put forward uh, uh, bold fiscal plans to uh, restore, uh, to, to promote growth uh, and to restore fiscal uh, sustainability and to consolidate the deficit over the medium. Right, I would love to have that list. So I, I'm looking forward to working with you as well. And when we, when we do get together, I'd love to have to see that list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank my colleague. And, and uh, for the Committee's information, uh, uh, we actually requested originally Mr. Sobel's uh, uh, superior at, uh, at Treasury, who perhaps could have answered uh, that question in particular uh, more sufficiently. Um, we have one final question. We have votes going on on the floor. And, um, uh, if I could just ask one uh, final set of questions here. Mr. Dudley, in your written testimony, you said if the European situation were to deteriorate further, financial markets would likely become more stressed. And you go through the scenarios for the American economy, then you say, and this is bold language for the Federal Reserve, at a time that U.S. unemployment is very, very high, this is a particularly unacceptable outcome. In the extreme, the U.S. Fi financial markets would become impaired, and you go forward there. Strong language for the Federal Reserve. So in, a, in the event of that scenario, that um, the European situation to, were to deteriorate further, uh, what is the Fed prepared to do to prevent this outcome? Well, I think my, my, my language was really more about how un unacceptable the high unemployment rate is and, and how uh, if the unemployment rate were to go higher because of events in Europe, that would be very uh, uns uh, unsatisfactory. To be specific, at, and my time is limited, I will read you the whole paragraph, and, and I think that that is not what the written but statement I'll, says. I will st stipulate to your, to your interpretation, just to, in, the, if, if in the interest of time. Uh, I think that you know, the Federal Reserve is doing what we think is appropriate to support lending here in the United States. And, you know, and that's why we, we have engaged with these foreign exchange swaps with the, with the five other central banks. I don't think we contemplate any other actions uh, at this time to do anything else uh, in terms of uh, providing assistance to, the, to Europe. It's really their problem to solve from the Federal Reserve's perspective. Uh, the ECB has liquidity uh, uh, facilities in place in, in, in terms of the euro currency. They now have swap lines that we think are very uh, sufficient to provide dollar liquidity. So I don't anticipate, uh, even if the crisis in Europe were to worsen, further steps on the, on the part of, 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 the, of the Federal Reserve at this time. Mr. Kamen, would the Fed consider purchasing sovereign debt held by U.S. banks to prevent this uh, further deterioration of the European situation? Um. I will defer to uh, President Dudley, who is on uh, the Federal Open Market Committee and is a Vice Chairman. Mr. Dudley? Well, I can't obviously speak for my fellow members on the committee, but I think the, uh, would you the, bar, the bar to doing that would be extraordinarily high. I, I cannot imagine uh, the circumstances in which we would think that was an appropriate uh, uh, action from a monetary policy perspective. We have the legal authority to buy sovereign, foreign sovereign debt, but this is really surrounding our uh, ability to conduct foreign exchange intervention operations. We have a very small portfolio that we run uh, with, the, with the Treasury that represents our foreign exchange reserves. Would, and and we, have never, we have never gone out and bought large portions of foreign sovereign debt in the history of the Fed that I am aware of. Okay. W would you consider accepting foreign uh, European sovereign debt as collateral against uh, loans? I think we uh, against additional loans. If we, you know, we we need to be secured to our satisfaction, and we do, do take a lot of care in our discount window lending and our other lending to make sure that the collateral that we give is appropriately haircutted and the Federal Reserve is well protected. That's one reason why, even despite the large amounts of sums that the Federal Reserve dispersed during the financial crisis, we did not lose a penny. We did, had no credit losses whatsoever, and the Federal Reserve, my understanding, the Federal so, Reserve so you never would had a credit consider loss. It? I wouldn't rule. I wouldn't necessarily rule it out. If the if the collateral is good collateral and it's pr appropriately haircutted, I don't think I would want to rule that out. Even if it's not AAA rated, we we accept collateral that's non AAA rated. Uh, so it, 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 the, the the important point is the quality of the collateral, the appropriateness of the pricing of that of that collateral, and the appropriate level of haircuts. That you know, the, you 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 do have to have protection in terms of the size of the haircuts. 
So that is important, but I wouldn't categorically rule that out. Should European banks uh, consider equity raising? You would have to talk to the European banking authorities, but the, stre the stress test there did suggest there was a capital need and equity raising, you know, I think I would be, I think that would be a, a welcome part of that because if they raise more equity, uh, then they have to do less deleveraging. And that would be far preferable? It would be my personal preference. All right. Mr. Yeah, I mean, they are already considering equity raising. That is one of the ways in which they could achieve their new higher capital standards. So that is very much in play. All right. So uh, with that, uh, you know, I, I realize your time is, is very important here. We have votes on the floor. Uh, members have had ample opportunity to ask questions this morning. Um, this hearing was about proper oversight from Congress of what uh, what our political branch at Treasury is doing um, and to, to address what is happening in Europe, what we see on the front pages, and what uh, raises great concern uh, across this country and around the world. We also want to see what the range of options are, are from, our, from our central bank. Um, and we uh, realize with this hearing that there are an enormous number of questions about this. Um, but we do see that our central bank, both with the New York Fed represented here today and our, uh, the, the governor, Board of Governors, have uh, uh, certainly have, have looked at the risk associated with this um, and have a, a range of plans uh, that they can um, pursue and a number of uh, policy options that they have. Um, I think that was very clear from today. What was disappointing is to not see that same level of planning from the Treasury, and uh, we're, we, I think that would be a, additional questions that we would have here on uh, the Hill uh, as, as uh, what, what the Treasury would consider uh, going forward, and we hope to have uh, additional oversight to, to make sure that we have that uh, disclosed to the public. So uh, we thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for uh, your willingness to engage in these discussions. Uh, uh, we realize that the questions uh, were broad uh, uh, reaching this morning, but uh, we certainly appreciate your willingness to be here. Uh, thank you for your service uh, to our government and to our people. And uh, with that, this committee stands adjourned.